thanks for being here. Okay, this is the first talk of the afternoon uh, session for today. We have Professor Stephen Law from the uh, Oxford University. So, uh, Professor Law uh, works uh, uh, currently at uh, Oxford University. Uh, before he worked at Heathrow College, University of London, until his closure. He also edits the philosophical journal Think, which is sponsored by the Royal Institute of Philosophy and published by the Cambridge University Press. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts and Commerce, and in 2008 he became the provost of the Centre for Inquiry UK. He developed the Evil God Challenge to the experiment. His published works include Israel, Palestine and Terror, really, really big question, a very short introduction to humanism and believing bullshit, how not to get sucked into an intellectual black hole. So please welcome Professor Law. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, a very kind introduction. I am flattered to be uh, invited and to participate in this event because you have some really fantastic uh, speakers. Um, I'm going to share with you um, my PowerPoint now. So let me do that. Good, OK, so um, what I thought I would do today is um, talk about this paper that I published back in 2018. And then um, there has since been a reply to this paper um, by McBrayer and Ellis. And I thought I would talk a little bit about their reply to the paper and, and why I'm not persuaded. So. That's what I thought I would do. Um, so I, I've kind of returned to this paper and I'm thinking about it again. And in fact, I may I may well publish um, a new paper um, that develops some of what I'm going to say here. So I hope it will be of interest. Um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to um, introduce the idea of a defeater, epistemic, epistemic defeat. That's the first job. Uh, secondly, I'm going to explain two undercutting defeater based arguments against religious beliefs that are grounded in religious experience. I imagine you're probably familiar with these arguments, but I'll set them out as clearly as I can. Um, and then I'm going to set out what I think is a different, a new undercutting defeater based argument against religious belief grounded in religious experience. Um, and I call it the X claim argument. Um, and then I'll explain why um, various familiar stock responses to the former arguments, the familiar arguments actually fail against this new argument or so I claim. Um, and then, um, if we've got time, um, I'll look at some objections um, to this new argument. Um, the objections might be that the argument is no good, or they might be that it's not a novel or new argument after all. And in fact, that is the line that McBrayer and Ellis take. They say, my argument is not new, it's just the same old arguments are rehashed. So. That's what I'm going to do. So to begin with, I'm going to um, insult your intelligence a little bit by just explaining some very basic stuff, um, undercutting defeaters. So suppose I seem to see a snake on the grass in front of me. We would ordinarily consider it to be reasonable for me to believe that there's a snake there, if, if that's how it looks. Um, but if I then get new information. If I'm told by a source I know to be generally trustworthy and reliable that I've been given a drug that causes very convincing snake hallucinations, well, now it's no longer reasonable for me to believe that there's a snake there just because that's how it looks. Um, my original belief or uh, the reasonableness of the belief is undercut by this new information. Is another classic illustration. Uh, suppose I see some objects, widgets, pass by on a production line and, and they look red. Well, then it's reasonable for me to believe that they are red, given that's how they look. And I have no reason to think there's anything funny going on. 
But if I'm then told that the widgets are lit by a red light, perhaps to re reveal imperfections in the widgets, and this red light will make even non-red things look red, well, then it's no longer reasonable for me to believe that the widgets are red. Again, my original belief is undercut by the new information. It's no longer reasonable for me to maintain it. Of course, it's not that I have evidence now that they're definitely not red. They could be red um, and there could, in fact, be a snake on the grass in front of me. It's just that it's no longer reasonable for me to hold these beliefs, given the new information. My um, my belief is undercut rather than rebutted. So <clears throat> these are classic examples of epistemic defeat. We have undercutting defeaters, new evidence. I acquire new evidence that the method by which I formed the belief is unreliable and not to be trusted. And so given, given this new evidence, it's no longer reasonable for me to believe on just that basis. Uh, that's the notion of epistemic defeat that I'm going to be drawing on. So now let's have a look at um, two popular undercutting defeater arguments against religious belief. So these are arguments that target religious belief that try to show that it's not reasonable um, by showing that we actually have undercutting defeaters for such beliefs. So the first argument is, is the argument from religious diversity. And the second argument is naturalistic debunking arguments. Actually, there's a range of arguments. So I'll look at two or three examples. So the suggestion is that um, by obtaining new information, uh, the person that held the religious belief um, ought no longer to maintain that belief. It's no longer reasonable for them to maintain that belief given the new information that they get. So let's have a look, first of all, at uh, the argument from religious diversity. Um, arguments from disagreement um, run like this. Where educated and well-informed people disagree, where they are epistemic peers and they disagree, then both have a reason to withhold belief. So here's a simple example. Suppose we're at a restaurant and we've got the bill. We're trying to work out um, what I should pay. And I work it out that it's £52.68p. But then I find you work it out to be £53.27p. Given that we're both reasonably good at maths, and I know that, um, it's no longer reasonable for me to believe that the total is £52.68. Before I got this new information that you got £53.27, it may have been reasonable for me to believe that the my contribution was £52.68. But once I find out that you, my epistemic peer, have come to a different judgment, well, then it's no longer reasonable for me to maintain my original belief. I should drop it. It has been undercut. So now if we look at religious beliefs, we find there are thousands of religions and that they largely contradict each other on, for example, the number of gods that there are, the character of gods that there are, the miracles that have been performed and so on. And so the majority of these beliefs must be false. They cannot all be true, or even most of them. It cannot be the case that most of them are true. Um, so we can now run an argument from disagreement. When the two agents recognise their epistemic peers and yet they disagree, each is provided with a a rationality defeater for the belief in question. Neither should be confident about having gotten it right. It's unreasonable then to continue to hold religious beliefs once we're in possession of this new information about the sheer diversity of religious belief. It might have been reasonable for me to maintain my religious beliefs while I was ignorant of that diversity, but once it's become apparent, once the sheer range of religious beliefs has been become clear to me, well, then it's no longer reasonable for me to maintain my belief, given that new evidence. I have put, I've come by an undercutting defeater. That's the, um, we'll call that the argument from religious diversity. I'm sure you're already familiar with it, um, but I've set it out as, as clearly as I can. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of stock responses to um, the argument from religious diversity or, or disagreement, as I put it there. Um, in particular, it's claimed that the principle that where there is disagreement, 
then we should withhold belief is just too strong. Um, and here are two reasons why it must be too strong. First of all, there's actually disagreement about the principle the itself that we where there is such disagreement amongst peers, both should hold withhold belief. Given that we actually disagree about that, us philosophers, then we cannot reasonably maintain the principle, the principle on which the actual, the argument is based. It's a it, it kind of undermines or undercuts itself this argument. Um, and then a second line of attack is to say that it proves too much, if you like. Um, it, we also disagree uh, when it comes to matters of politics um, and indeed morality. You find epistemic peers disagreeing um, on pretty much every political issue and on pretty much every moral question. Um, you find a range of views, you find people contradicting each other, uh, and these people appear to be epistemic peers. So it seems that we we, we can't reasonably given this new information, we no one can reasonably hold a political or moral point of view, certainly not when there's someone else that appears to be their peer disagreeing with them, and there almost always is. Um, now that's just that's just too strong a principle, surely. Um, surely it is reasonable for me to maintain my political views, even when I come to realise that there are other people just as intelligent and well-educated as me who happen to disagree with me. And if that's true in the political sphere, then it's true in the religious sphere also. Just because I discover that there are people who disagree with me, with my religious beliefs, hold different religious beliefs, and they are, to all intents and purposes, just as intelligent and well-informed as me, that doesn't give me a, a good reason to abandon my religious beliefs. The same holds true in the religious sphere as holds true in the political sphere. So there you go. There are two stock um, responses to the argument from religious diversity or disagreement. So um, now we can move on to what I call naturalistic debunking arguments. Um, there are various attempts to explain religious belief um, naturalistically. So you find Marx attempting to explain why people hold religious beliefs by pointing to social distinction and uh, dislocation. Freud um, attempts naturalistically to explain religious belief as a result of some form of wish fulfillment. And then more recently, we have the Cognitive Science of Religion, CSR, which is developing various explanations for religious belief, including um, the HADD um, hypothesis, hyperactive agency device. Um, the suggestion is that we have evolved to over detect agency. Why? Because if there's an agent there and we miss it, it's likely to take it out, take you out of the gene pool. Um, and so you won't get to pass your uh, genetic genetic material on. Whereas if um, there's no agent present um, and you falsely believe there is, well, that's not nearly as costly to you, um, much less likely to take you out of the gene pool. So we, 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 we've evolved to be overly sensitive to agency, to tend to see agency where, there, where actually there isn't any. Uh, we're very prone to false positive beliefs in agency, seeing agency where there is none. And that, according to some in the cognitive science of religion, at least partly explains religious belief, belief in angels and demons and gods and so on. We are seeing agency, detecting agency, where in truth uh, there is none. So there are these various um, naturalistic explanations on offer for religious belief. And it's suggested uh, that these naturalistic explanations show that religious beliefs are being produced by mechanisms that are unreliable. Um, the HADD, the hyperactive agency detecting device, if that's responsible for my religious belief, well, um, that's not a mechanism that is likely to produce true religious beliefs. It's just as likely to produce false as true religious beliefs. But then given that I know that my um, religious beliefs are a product of the HADD, I now, I'm now coming by an undercutting defeater for my religious beliefs. It's no longer reasonable for me to 
hold these beliefs, given that I know they are a product of an unreliable mechanism. So that's a classic example of a naturalistic debunking arguments, a de debunking argument. There are these natural natural mechanisms which are supposed to account for religious belief, and the suggestion is that these mechanisms are not going to produce reliable, mostly true beliefs. Um, and once we know that, then we can no longer have much confidence in our own um, religious beliefs, knowing that they're produced by such a mechanism, such, by such an unreliable mechanism. Those are naturalistic debunking um, arguments. Naturalistic debunking arguments are also um, criticised. Um, here are two stock responses to them. Um, first of all, um, it suggested that we're often given very little reason to think that the proposed naturalistic explanations of religious belief are true. So Elvin Plantinga, for example, says that, you know, Freud, for example, gives us almost no reason to suppose that his explanation is actually correct. There's no evidence to support it. It's just speculation. Um, and the cognitive science of religion is often accused of just cooking up just so stories, um, stories that perhaps explain religious belief, but we're not being given any evidence to suppose that the story is actually correct. So if, there are, if there's little reason to think that the proposed explanations of religious belief are true, then even if these explanations would posit, do posit um, unreliable mechanisms, we don't need to worry as religious believers that our um, beliefs are undercut because there's no particular reason to think that these mechanisms are actually producing our beliefs. For all we know, our beliefs are reliably produced by God or some other entirely reliable mechanism, not by one of these naturalistic uh, mechanisms. So that's the first objection. And then the second objection is that even if the um, explanations are correct that are offered by these naturalistic theories, actually, that's not to say that any undercutting defeater is produced. Um, it's suggested by some, including people working in the cognitive science of religion, for example. So Professor Justin Barrett, who is very much a fan of the HADD explanation of religious belief, he doesn't think that this mechanism, the hyperactive agency detecting device, the fact that that is producing religious belief, he doesn't think that, well, that shows that religious belief is being produced by an unreliable mechanism. Um, it may be that God has actually created the HADD in order to allow us to know about him. That's Justin Barrett's suggestion, um, in which case it's not unreliable at all. It's very much aimed at giving us true beliefs. Um, so the HADD is part of a mechanism aimed at producing true belief, suggests Justin Barrett and indeed others like um, Michael Murray. The mere fact that a mechanism, a naturalistic mechanism, such as the HADD, is producing our religious beliefs, that doesn't that information doesn't provide us with an undercutting defeater for the religious produ beliefs produced by that mechanism, at least not according to Justin Barrett. So there we go, two stock responses to um, naturalistic debunking arguments. There's little reason to suppose that the proposed explanations are true, and even if they are true, that doesn't actually necessarily give us a defeater for our religious beliefs. So I now want to um, shift to this other, well, so I claim, this other new argument, um, which I'm going to suggest is different to the two arguments that we just looked at. And I'm going to call this new argument um, the X claim argument. Um, so what do I mean by an X claim? Well, it's something quite specific. Um, X claims concern the existence of extraordinary hidden agents and associated extraordinary powers and faculties and objects and events. So these hidden agents might be our dead ancestors, ghosts, spirit beings, uh, nature spirits, um, perhaps alien visitors uh, working behind the scenes. They're here already and are secretly working uh, behind the scenes. Angels and demons, 
um, elves, fairies, and indeed gods. These are all extraordinary hidden agents, beings that are, for the most part at least, hidden, uh, for the most part, not available to our, 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 our five senses. <clears throat> Um, there are also extraordinary powers associated with these beings. They beings themselves often have are supposed to have extraordinary powers and uh, faculties. They're able to do extraordinary, miraculous things, raise people from the dead and so on. Um, and we are also sometimes supposed to have certain extraordinary abilities so we can come to know that there's a dead person in the room with us, for example, by means of our having some kind of spirit sense, or we can come to know that there is a God or there are gods by virtue of our having some kind of special, extraordinary God sense or sensus divinitatus. So the X claim argument concerns X claims, claims concerning the existence of these extraordinary hidden agents and associated powers, faculties, objects, and events. Uh, <clears throat> the powers include creating life, healing. Um, sometimes it's suggested that um, uh, these beings can read our thoughts. Uh, some of us, as I say, are sometimes supposed to have super faculties by which we can know about these hidden agents. The fact is that it, extraordinarily, almost every culture has X claim beliefs. Um, there's almost nowhere, I don't know, at every time, at every place, you find X claim beliefs being held and an extraordinary variety of X claim beliefs too. Um, they are typically grounded in either testimony or subjective experience or some combination of the two. So you find that, you know, a psychic or a witness to a miracle cure will testify about what they've experienced. Um, or testify that they have themselves had some kind of experience of um, one of these extraordinary hidden agents. And so, so we have their testimony to go on. Um, or perhaps they've witnessed some miracle that's supposedly been performed by some extraordinary hidden agent, such as a god. So we have their testimony. And then we also, in some cases, uh, have our own subjective experiences. Um, you know, perhaps you feel that your dead auntie is in the room with you. You have a very, very strong sense of her presence and that convinces you that she is actually there. Um, or perhaps you have some kind of religious experience. It just seems to you that there is a God or that Jesus loves you or whatever, whatever it may happen to be. Um, that experience may lead you to hold an exclaim belief. So exclaim beliefs are typically grounded in some combination of testimony and subjective experience. And we know that the vast majority of these exclaimed beliefs must be false. Now, of course, one reason we know the vast majority must be false is that they contradict each other. Um, these beliefs over here contradict those beliefs over there. They can't both be true. So there is um, disagreement, but there's not just disagreement. Uh, this is the key point I wish to make. There is, in addition, other evidence supporting the claim that we are highly unreliable when it comes to uh, holding such beliefs. Um, for example, many such beliefs have been, have been directly successfully debunked. If you take out a subscription to a magazine like Skeptical Inquirer, you'll find every month you'll be provided with a whole um, list of new examples of people believing that someone's been raised from the dead or that there was a ghost present or whatever it might happen to be. And it's shown beyond any reasonable doubt that the belief is false. Um, there are many classic examples in the paper that this talk is based on. I provide a number of illustrations such as, for example, um, a spirit being that turned out to be um, an owl. There's no doubt that it was an owl. Um, or a ghost that turned out to be an automatic air freshener. Um, so very many X claims beliefs, positive X claim beliefs have been successfully debunked. There is in addition a growing body of scientific, uh, including experimental evidence that we are prone to over detect and over attribute agency, resulting in us positing agency, including extraordinary hidden agency, where in truth um, 
there isn't any. Um, we, that, and that includes experimental evidence. So all of this evidence added to the fact that there's also considerable disagreement when it comes to which X claims are true and they can't all be true. That provides us with good evidence that we're highly prone to false positive beliefs in extraordinary hidden agents. Notice that there's no such evidence that we're prone to false negative beliefs, only false positive beliefs. So um, um, if you look at disagreement alone, um, the fact that there's a considerable disagreement among, amongst us so far as um, ghosts and fairies and elves and so on is concerned, gods, that does not show that the sceptic um, is probably correct and everyone else is wrong. All of the beliefs, including the negative beliefs, are equally thrown into doubt by mere disagreement. However, we've got more than mere disagreement. We also have many positive claims being successfully debunked, but not negative claims. People are not failing to spot extraordinary hidden beings that are there. We have no illustrations of that whatsoever. We just have many examples of false positive claims. Um, and we have this growing body of scientific evidence, as I say, that we are prone to over detect and over attribute agency, not under detect it, over detect it. We're seeing it where it isn't where it isn't there. So um, it seems then that we have good grounds for thinking we're highly prone to false positive belief in X claims when grounded in testi testimony and subjective experience. Um, it's not to say that there couldn't be really good evidence for ghosts or whatever. Um, there could be, um, but I'm going to suggest that if it's rooted in testimony and subjective experience, um, then we really do have an undercutting defeater for such a belief. Uh, anyone who holds a positive X claim belief, given this new information, they've been provided with an undercutting defeat of their belief is what I'm suggesting. Here it, in effect, is the argument, um, or here's a stab at setting out the argument. Maybe it needs refining a little bit, but here's a first stab at it. So by S and T, um, I'll mean subjective experience and testimony. And then the argument runs as follows. Uh, premise one, we are highly prone to false positive X claim beliefs when they're grounded in S and T, subjective experience and testimony. Uh, pretty clearly true, I think. Two, learning one supplies a subject with a rationality defeater for any positive X claim belief of theirs grounded in just S and T. It's no longer reasonable for them to be confident in their belief, given that they now know that we're highly prone to false positive X claim beliefs. Uh, three, suppose S's religious positive X claim beliefs are indeed grounded in just S and T. That's it. That's the only basis for their belief. Well, then for learning one supplies S with a rationality defeater for their religious positive X claim beliefs. I'm calling that the X claim argument, and I am claiming that it is distinct from um, the two arguments we looked at earlier, the argument from religious diversity or disagreement and naturalistic debunking arguments. Um, there is overlap, of course. There, there are similarities. Like the argument from religious diversity and naturalistic debunking arguments, the X claim argument aims to supply an undercutting defeater for religious belief. Yes, it is another undercutting defeater argument. But, and this is the key point, um, the X claim argument is immune to all of the objections we saw raised against those other arguments, interestingly. So let me now explain why I think that is so. Uh, we saw that the argument from diversity or disagreement was criticised on the grounds that one, it relies on a self-defeating principle, that where there is disagreement, belief should be withheld. And two, that moral and political beliefs can be reasonably maintained by epistemic peers despite their disagreeing. Why does the X claim argument sidestep these objections? Well, it doesn't require that belief be withheld merely dif given disagreement. So it doesn't, it's not self undermining in the way that um, the argument from diversity or disagreement is. Um, the evidence of our unreliability regarding positive X claims um, extends well beyond mere disagreement. 
Um, so it seems to me that both of these objections are sidestepped. Um, it's not it's not just dis disagreement may not be enough to provide you with an undercutting def defeat of your beliefs, but we have considerably more than disagreement. Um, and so these objections fail to apply. Now let's look at naturalistic debunking arguments. Um, they face the objections that number one, the explanations offered look dubious and may not be true. The HADD device, that explanation in terms of an HADD for religious belief or exclaimed beliefs, um, it's dubious, it may not be true. Um, perhaps it's a just so story. Um, secondly, even if true, even if the explanation is correct, even if the beliefs are being produced by an HADD or whatever it may happen to be, um, the fact is that the beliefs could still be formed by a reliable truth aimed mechanism. It may be that God has put the HADD in us so that we can come to know of his existence, or so claims uh, Professor Justin Barrett. The X claim argument, on the other hand, doesn't require any particular naturalistic explanation to be correct. None are required to be correct. In fact, it might be that the explanation for why we're so prone to false positive X claim beliefs is that there, there is something supernatural going on. <laughs> Only there aren't gods and elves and fairies and so on, but there's something else back there that is causing us to um, be, be prone, systematically prone to these kind of mistakes. Um, certainly, I don't need to suppose that the HADD explanation is correct or that Freud or Marx's explanations are correct. I'm not supposing any of that. I'm just pointing to the fact, a well-established fact, that we're highly prone to false positive beliefs in X claims when they're grounded in just um, uh, s and as I put it, testimony and subjective experience. That is a well-established fact. That's all I'm pointing to. I don't require any particular naturalistic explanation to be correct. So again, the X claim argument is immune to the objections which are raised against naturalistic debunking arguments. They require that the explanations be correct. My argument does not. Um, and um, that, well, that's it. So moving on to sum up. Um, the X claim argument is distinct from and appears to avoid stock objections to two familiar arguments based on you know, the idea that there's some kind of undercutting defeater for religious beliefs. The argument from religious disagreement and naturalistic debunking arguments. And um, my paper, the X claim argument against religious belief, really aimed to give pause for thought to those who think that standard responses to these two arguments effectively deal with all such undercutting defeater arguments based on our alleged unreliability when it comes to forming religious beliefs. It seems to me that they don't. And in fact, that there's this other argument, which I'm calling the X claim argument in the vicinity, that is actually entirely immune to the standard responses to these two arguments. Now, that's not to say that the X claim argument is a good argument. Maybe it's not. Um, and I'm not in the paper um, arguing that it is a good argument. Um, seems to me prima facie a pretty powerful argument. My point in the paper is that it, it's not been dealt with. Uh, people, are, people have not engaged with what seems to be a far more powerful undercutting defeater objection, um, far more powerful um, than um, the argument from religious disagreement and naturalistic debunking arguments. So yeah, you know, I'm just flagging that there is this other concern that seems to me to be a rather more serious concern and people are not actually um, addressing it as yet. Um, so um, let me just flag some limitations uh, of the X claim argument. It's only targeting religious beliefs grounded in testimony and experience. If you've got a belief in God, say, that's based on, for example, a philosophical argument, your belief is not threatened by the X claim argument. If you have a belief in ghosts that's based on some kind of laboratory experiment, your belief is not threatened by the X claim argument. It only targets religious beliefs grounded in testimony and experience. Those are the beliefs 
that we clearly are unreliable about. Um, however, belief in many core religious claims, such as the resurrection or the divinity of Jesus or whatever, are entirely grounded in testimony and or subjective experience. There's no a priori philosophical argument for um, the resurrection. To the extent that we believe it and, uh, and think that it's true, it, that our belief is rooted in testimony, um, in anecdotes written down in books by um, in, in the Gospels and so on. Um, so these beliefs are undercut by this new information regarding X claim unreliability. Um, it might be reasonable to believe in the resurrection if you're ignorant of our general unreliability regarding X claims, but now you have that new information, it's no longer reasonable for you to maintain your religious belief, it seems. Um, it's, it's unreasonable to continue to believe that Christianity is true if that requires such beliefs. And many core Christian claims do appear to involve X claims rooted solely in subjective experience um, and testimony. People believe because uh, they just know, they think, and perhaps the Holy Spirit has revealed to them that it's true, that Jesus was resurrected, resurrected from the dead, um, or they think that the Gospels provide them with ample evidence that Jesus was resurrected from the dead, or perhaps they believe on the basis of both those things. Um, secondly, uh, the exclaim argument might perhaps fall short of making religious X claims beliefs based on sense, sorry, subjective experience and testimony unreasonable. But even if it did fail to do that, it could still re significantly reduce the reasonableness, reasonableness of such beliefs um, by contributing to a cumulative case. Now, um, I've used up about 38 minutes. Um, I have a little bit more that I could say. Um, but I'm aware that maybe you'd rather have some Q&A. So what do you think? Would, uh, I've got another five minutes of material, um, which I can talk about, or we can just stop here. It's up to you. Any any views? Uh, please continue. I mean, uh, we have this talk and then another talk. Uh, so we have just, I mean, I would like to hear more. Um, no worries. Okay. So, here we go. so um, in the International Journal, sorry, Journal of um, Philosophy of Religion, um, Justin McBrayer uh, and Weston Ellis published a paper which attempts to show that the X claim argument against religious belief offers nothing new. So they're not attempting to refute the argument, they're just saying that the argument is nothing new, it's a familiar argument, with they, they already knew about it in effect. Um, I'm I'm just repackaging arguments with which we're all that they're, we we're all completely familiar. Um, how do they argue? Well, they say if you look at my premise, the first premise of the X claim argument, it is that we're highly prone to false positive X claim beliefs when they're grounded in subjective experience and testimony. Now they say this is probably true. But why does it provide a rationality defeater for any particular belief in extraordinary agents grounded in just subjective experience and testimony? The mere fact that a proposition is a member of a set that are mostly false will not all by itself be enough to generate a defeater. The boundaries of the um, set. Uh, oops, I think I just mucked that up. Can you still see? Oh no, here we go. Uh, could be generated, could be ger gerrymandered. So uh, that's a little bit abstract. So they provide an illustration. Uh, the proposition the Earth revolves around the sun is a member of the set containing all false propositions, plus the proposition that the Earth revolves around the sun. But the fact that that proposition belongs to that set of mostly false propositions does not provide us with a defeater for that belief. Similarly, then, in bundling in religious beliefs with other beliefs about extraordinary hidden agency, um, we may be just gerrymandering their membership. Um, there's no real justification for including religious beliefs in with these other uh, beliefs. Um, what the, uh, McBrayer and Ellis say is what's missing is an explanation of why facts about the set of beliefs in general can somehow infect particular members of the set. So why facts about X claim beliefs 
in general can somehow infect our religious beliefs, the religious members of the third. So McVeigh and Ellis don't deny that my first premise is true, but they insist that in order to justify it, we must do one of the following two things. First of all, show that most of the beliefs in the X claim belief set are false, and there's no reason to think that the religious beliefs are relevantly different from the rest. But at this point, they insist that that would rely on using the argument from religious disagreement or diversity. So we're back to the same old argument with which we were familiar before we looked at the X claim argument. Or they say we learn that beliefs about agency grounded in s and are a product of, for example, an HADD. And we show that the HADD is unlikely to produce true beliefs about God. But this is the naturalistic debunking argument. So while there may be problems for religious belief here, they're not new problems. Um, all I'm doing is I'm repackaging the old problems and pre pretending, if you like, that um, there's some novel uh, objection uh, being raised. But there, but there really isn't. So um, to that, I say, well, I don't think that's true. You won't be surprised to hear me say I don't think that's true. Um, I think they are mistaken. Um, first of all, religious beliefs about gods and spirits and so on and the associated powers, I'm not arbitrarily including them with other X claim beliefs. They are included because they concern extraordinary hidden agents and associated powers. And we have good evidence that we're highly prone to false positive beliefs about such agents and powers. So it's reasonable to bundle in religious beliefs with these other X claim beliefs, beliefs about ghosts and fairies and whatever it may happen to be. Second, while the evidence for the proneness to false positive beliefs in such agents and powers includes religious diversity and disagreement, as I admitted, acknowledged, the point is it extends well beyond mere disagreement. As I pointed out, there is scientific and indeed experimental evidence to support the, the claim that we are prone to false positive beliefs in X claims. Um, plus, we have directly debunked many such positive beliefs, including religious examples. Many religious examples have been directly debunked. So I'm certainly not just relying on uh, religious disagreement and diversity. There's a lot more involved here. Um, and uh, nor does the case for the premise regarding religious beliefs and such agents and powers include arguing that certain mechanisms, such as the hyperactive agency detecting device, account for religious beliefs. And these mechanisms are unlikely reliably to deliver true beliefs. That's, in, that's just no part of my argument at all. I, I make no claim about what it is that's causing us to be unreliable. I simply point to the unreliability, which is well established. So it seems to me that um, I can make a good case for suggesting that X claims are, you know, belief in positive X claims are beliefs about which we are clearly unreliable. We're highly prone to false positive beliefs. That is the first premise. And I can make a case for doing that without relying on uh, naturalistic debunking arguments or merely relying on uh, religious disagreement and diversity. There's a lot more to it than that. Um, so, uh, yeah, my case for thinking we're unreliable when it comes to religious belief in such extraordinary hidden agents and powers is grounded, one, not in certain theories about the mechanisms that produce such beliefs, such as an HADD, and not just in the diversity of such beliefs, but rather in a broader range of evidence that we're highly prone to false positive beliefs in extraordinary hidden agents and powers more generally. And that is why the examined stock responses to naturalistic debunking arguments and arguments from religious diversity fail to deal with the X claim argument. Um, it is a distinct, if, unre relate, if related, um, line of argument. So there it is again, that is the, um, the X claim argument, just to remind you. And um, perhaps I will now turn off the slideshow if I can go back to music. Okay. Stop sharing. Okay, I think of I think of 
Perfect. Thank you. You got me back? I'm back. Yes. OK. You are back. Great. Thanks a lot for this amazing talk. Thank you very much. So questions? I can see a question already. I have questions as well, but ah, ciao Stalia Ferro. OK, um, thank you so much for this very clear paper and um, the, the systematic care you gave um, the objections. And one just comment on your interlocutors at the International Journal for Philosophy of Religion. I haven't seen the issue, but for somebody to reply that you were just pretending to come up with a new argument, if that, that language was used, I think is not um, commendable. This is to suggest that there's somehow a lack of integrity or honesty in the critic. I think that we should, I intend this comment for everybody that for me to say you only are pretending to have an argument is, is would be an insult, it seems to me. So I, th I think you do have an argument, and I think it's a very interesting one. Um, I, I, just, I guess I, I need, could I just oh, say sorry. I don't for a minute I don't for a minute wish to suggest that they thought that I was just pretending. Uh, that oh, okay. Not at all. No, no. Okay, you used the word uh, pretending. If my memory serves me, but thanks for the clarification. You're right, I did, but actually that perhaps that was misleading. I didn't, I was certainly not intending to uh, suggest that they were suggesting I was somehow being um, uh, deliberately misleading. If I, did, if I did that, I'm sorry. Okay, um, all right. So I I think I, I am going to suggest though that um, there might be something to this worry that the class that you've picked out and you've I didn't quite write down all of them. There were ghosts, fairies, elves, uh, aliens, mm -hmm. dead ancestors. There was the uh, auntie and so on. And yeah. what strikes me is a um, little um, vexing is that if you look at the main argument from religious experience as it was developed by Swinburne and William Alston, um, Kaiman Kwan, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. The, the the argument that's out there, like if you look at the society, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, that's the argument that you'll see, mm -hmm. largely representing those thinkers. And what they would do is, um, I believe anyway, I think that or the best case would be to seek to um, really differentiate the reasonability of believing in fairies versus the reasonable reasonability of believing when it is in the awesome presence of God or the living Christ. So mm. when I think that one thing that separates um, the alpha class, you know, with this huge class, is they all might be supernatural. And that is using the term supernatural in the way Hobbes used it. It, it definitely included really queer entities. But the reason why most of us, I defend the argument from religious experience, and um, we prefer the word theism rather than supernatural because supernatural covers um, werewolves and witches and wizards and so on. So um, the one thing that's going for Alston and so on is that they have an overall metaphysical picture of theism when they defend the coherence of it and its probative force. Someone like Swinburne even believes that you can have enough evidence to believe that it's likely that there would be an encounter with um, this God. And in mm. fact, the, the significant testimony of, of this is, is quite extraordinary. And that's, we don't have, now I deeply respect actually Shintoism and its invocation of spirits. And I, I teach environmental ethics and I find most of my students who've been traveled in Japan and in Asia have uh, really takes solace in this kind of, uh, so I'm not alien to it. And one of really great paper on ghosts was written by a Chinese scholar, uh, Victoria Harrison, you may know her. Um, anyway, there's a difference between, there's no metaphysics that would give us, well, you can get ghosts out of theism in the sense that you have the belief for the, for uh, most Jews, not all Jews, but for Christians and Muslims, death is not the annihilation of the individual. So you can get the idea that there's an afterlife from these schemes. But um, anyway, the, the difference between the class of objects that you've got are uh, they're metaphysically 
the, the one, the, the theistic ones, and I'd say even Buddhist ones, are backed up by metaphysical theories that make sense of these, and you can argue about them independently. I think you suggested this, actually, so this isn't new. <laughs> I'm not pretending it's new, but mm. um, anyway, I, I wonder if you've taken that into account. It's true. I hadn't, I hadn't, not in the paper, really. Maybe I should, maybe I should um, think a bit more about that. I mean, that, that's interesting. Um, um, I mean, when you talk about metaphysical theories, um, I suppose you could develop a metaphysical theory for which you thought there was a powerful philosophical case. And then you could say, and if this theory is correct, um, um, you know, perhaps a case for God, even, um, and a case for God having given us a census divinitatis. Well, then, given all of that additional philosophical argument, it's it's no longer unreasonable um, to distrust your uh, religious experience. You could you can do that um, certainly, um, but of course, um, what I was doing was focusing on beliefs that are wholly rooted in. Um, subjective experience and testimony. Um, I made the point that you could make a philosophical argument for these beings. Um, you know, you could make a philosophical argument for your preferred metaphysical system that includes gods or ghosts or whatever it may happen to be. Um, and um, if if you're doing that, well, then I, 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 I'm not providing you with any kind of undercutting defeater. Um, and it may be then that armed with that metaphysical theory, um, which you've justified um, without appealing to s and you can then um, um, make a good case for suggesting that actually these experiences or you know, some, religious, some, of, some of these religious experiences um, are, are, can be trusted. They are distinct from the rest of the X claim set because they have this peculiar additional feature. So you could, yeah, you certainly could do that. And I haven't really spent much time thinking about that. And I think that if I pursue this a bit further, then I will. I think that's a good idea to, to think about that a little, little bit. Um, what I'm really concerned with mostly here are those who um, um, rely very much on, not on philosophical argument at all, they just say, look, I just know that God is real. I just know that Jesus loves me because they just revealed themselves to me in, in this way. Plus, you know, I've got the, I've got the good book. I've got the testimony. Um, um, it, it, for, for those individuals who don't have a sound philosophical argument to back over any of this stuff, um, they certainly are in big trouble. But maybe a sophisticated philosophical thinker who's got an independent metaphysical theory that they can provide good grounds for, if they can do that, uh, they, they, as I as I pointed out, they may not be in any trouble at all. Um, I'm only threatening a certain certain beliefs grounded in S and T, as I as I put it. Does that sound? Am I being? No, I, I think that's fair enough. I, I would suppose though that when we're thinking about um, theism, whether classical or in its variations, we're not um, we're not in a seance. We're not do, dealing with um, an ostensible reality that just popped up in terms of world history, but rather hmm. religious traditions that go back to um, very early 2000 BCE. We have the Vedas, we have all kinds of testimonies, the Bhagavad Gita and so on. And so there's a difference between, okay, in an earlier paper, I'm not sure you, you were here, where someone was thinking about reformed epistemology yeah, and the speaker, oh, good. The speaker was saying, my mother doesn't need to know the ontological argument. Now I defended it in print, but it's not the best. It's not, if we were, you know, I'm, I'm going head to head with Graham Abbey, whose first book was on the ontological argument. I'm not gonna pull that out without, a, unless we have a good month to talk about it. But I would say, you, you use the word threat, which is kind of a um, big word. I mean, it's, it's almost like a violent word. And I suppose to me anyway, for the, the ordinary religious believer is part of a, Massive tradition. Of course, everybody could be wrong, but the Pew Foundation has, I think it's as high as 84% of the world is religiously identified, which would be eight out of 10 people that you run into globally. And the largest religions are theistic. And so 
Well, the auntie who goes to mass may not need to know Barrett's view or how to respond to Marx and Freud. But I also think that they, or you know, he, she, whatever, um, are part of a community which includes uh, intellectuals, it includes philosophers, theologians, scientists, and the mm -hmm. like. And that distinguishes the auntie going to mass in Sao Paulo um, from the seance in which um, kids in the dorm room are thinking that they've discovered a ghost or fairy. Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a fair point. Um, I think what, um, yeah, maybe what I need to do, maybe what would be worth doing actually is spending a bit more time looking at some of these other beliefs um, and the way in which they're defended um, because often there, there are similarities between the ways that the moves that theists make and the moves that spiritualists and people who believe that they are psychic and so on, the moves that they make. Um, uh, I think I, it's well worth investigating that a bit more. I, I'm, I don't think I know enough about these other these other belief systems at this point to to comment, you know, very authoritatively on whether or not they too can uh, draw on um, a kind of a long-standing uh, intellectual tradition, which they particular psychic might not be particularly familiar with, um, but it is there, uh, you know, the spiritualists or whatever it may happen to be. Um, in, in which case we have a, 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 an analogous situation. So I probably need to look at that a bit more as well. So these are good points. I, I, I appreciate them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, thanks a lot. So we have another question for Professor Agnaldo. Agnaldo. So thank you, Professor, Lau, for your talk. It's just a um, clarification question, sure. actually. Uh, I had the impression initially that you had a stronger claim um, that um, your argument would be a kind of defeat for religious belief. But by the end of your paper, you seem to have admitted that it could be part of a, a cumulative case. Only. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just so, wanted to make. Uh, it sounded, sounded a kind of plan B. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah. In which case yeah. would that be only part of a cumulative case instead of a knocking down an argument? Uh, my view is that uh, it's probably a good knocking down argument. But even if you could show, my point was that even if you could show that it, it fails to entirely demolish uh, the rationality of um, some positive X claim belief rooted in just S and T, nevertheless, it might put a serious significant dent in the rationality of that belief and so contribute to a cumulative case against the rationality and reasonableness of that belief. I was I was merely adding that, you know, it's not a, it wouldn't be enough to entirely dismiss the argument to show that it fails to entirely undercut the reasonableness of such a belief because it, it might yet um, put a big dent in it. Um, so I, I was just flagging that, just making that point in case someone thought that all they needed to do to entirely diffuse the problem that I'm raising is point out that it somehow fell short of completely undermining the rationality of um, an X claim belief rooted in just those two things. That's what I was doing. All right, thank you. Yeah, I wasn't back. I didn't think I was backpedaling. Maybe I was. I <laughs> Great. Thank you for the clarification. Any other question, or if not, I have a couple of questions actually. Ah. Oh. Ok, one in Portuguese that I can translate. Unless you speak Portuguese, do you? I'm afraid not. E isso che filosofia costuma non levare a serio. Ah, it's mais an observation, so... Uh, oh, let me see, let me see. Muito bom. Uh, one is happy about the fact that he's surprised, positively surprised by the fact that philosophy of religion can be interesting and amusing as well. Great, it's a lot of subject. Uh, okay. Ah, then we have a huge. Ah, Edney Gonzalez. Thanks for the presentation, Professor Lowe. You mentioned that your argument can contribute to a cumulative case. 
I was thinking if this could work the other way around. Maybe a good philosophical argument for the existence of the Christian God grouped with a good argument for the probability that this particular God would raise that particular person from the dead will take the belief in the resurrection out of the group of exclaimed beliefs, or at least the change his status a little bit. Uh, maybe you can, you want to read it? It's in the chat, if you can. Yeah. I, I know, I, I think, I think I, I think I, if I've understood correctly, I think I, I um, agree that you could have a, um, a philosophical argument um, for uh, the existence of God. Um, and uh, that would not be threatened at all. Uh, there was no risk of that, <coughs> reason that belief being undercut um, um, by my exclaim argument. Um, maybe I haven't fully understood the point though. Um, let me just... Ed, do you want to add something? Are you here? Yes, yes, but I think that uh, I said all that I wanted to say. I, I, I'm not even certain that Professor Law uh, hasn't answered this this particular doubt of mine in the in his answer to Professor Talia Ferro. Maybe the the two questions are related. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, any other question or? I yeah, have a couple of questions. I mean, you're running late, but I, mean, I hope that Fabio will understand. So uh, my first question is, like you mentioned briefly, like it's not the topic of your talk, but you mentioned it. So the religious disagreement, and I was wondering why religious dis disagreement should lead to atheism. So, and not to a sort, a sort of general, especially as you have presented it, and not a sort of general agnosticism, say, yeah. we agree, or... Uh, even uh, better from uh, a theistic perspective to a sort of generic theism. Because the thing that uh, theists disagree upon are less than the things that theists agree upon. Say, for instance, uh, in the monotheistic tradition, we agree that there is one God that, uh, uh, that he thinks about us, that is concerned about us. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> so the disagreement, especially among theists, is uh, less uh, pervasive and uh, less strong than I would seem. So why the fact that there is a religious agreement should lead to atheism and not simply to either uh, agnosticism, say a suspension of belief, like both from uh, the theist and the non-theist, they should uh, agree that they disagree and the, <coughs> excuse me, and there is no conclusive evidence, either positive or negative, and so just a suspension of judgment. If not, a sort of generic theism, say, let, let's agree that, uh, you know, that the things with the taste have in common are more than the things they disagree upon. Like all taste uh, in the monotheistic tradition believe that there is a God, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's something that, and uh, also like uh, in the history of uh, philosophical thought, uh, like in the history of philosophy, like you have more taste Gener of generic theism than, than not. So I was thinking, uh, so this is my first question. And second question is, uh, actually, I agree with your argument. So is the question, let me just, because I'm not entirely sure I know what the question is. <laughs> so, um, so is your question, um, mere religious disagreement is not a case, does, does not provide us with a case for rejecting uh, the positive beliefs, but merely being agnostic? Yeah, say, yeah. I agree. I think. I mean, it's, I think I agree with you. Um, um, well, but the X claim argument, on the other, on the other hand, uh, brings in a lot of additional evidence that points to specifically to our being unreliable when it comes to positive beliefs. But there's no corresponding evidence for our being unreliable when it comes to negative beliefs. So suddenly. Uh, things get shifted in when, when it comes to the X claim argument. But when it comes to mere disagreement, well, you know, this person believes there's no God, this person one, this person two, this person three. Um, sh should we go with the no God because of the the fact that these other people um, 
disagree amongst themselves. No, no. I mean, this is the the person who thinks that there's no God. Uh, their 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 view is also um, being undercut by the disagreement. Um, so yeah, so you won't get an argument for atheism, positive atheism, out of religious disagreement. I suspect. I'll have to think about it. Um, but the exclaim argument has this advantage that you will. I you see. Should, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, uh, yeah, it's a sort of first stage. Like, first, uh, there is this. Uh, okay, and uh, this thing that uh, interests me. And uh, I, I'm a theist, but I completely buy the, the X, uh, X argument. So either I have not understood completely the implication of the argument of because it seems to me that at the end of the day, like is in his argument that Riley so points to folk, uh, like I'll say folk religion or uh, magical thinking or animism of some sort that yeah is pervasive and uh, it's something that many tastes are positively against and uh, say just take the case of uh, Aquinas. Aquinas was historically uh, the bunker of uh, this kind of thing. Like one of his uh, works was like to show that many miracles, alleged miracles, were not miracles at all. And uh, it's a concern of so the Catholic Church, for instance. They have a sort of team that goes there and to verify whether miracles are for real or not. So yeah, I was thinking maybe uh, you know the X argument works. And perfectly in order to address a like uh, folk religion, animism, paganism, the idea that there are forces behind them. But you know, does not work with the kind of uh, theistic beliefs, like the fact that simply there is a like there is a being, a supernatural being that so that created the universe. Or, or for instance, in the case of the of the probability of the resurrection, for instance. So I am thinking on the argument by William Lane Craig. I don't see a lot of X, uh, uh, X thinking in that. It's just like a matter of probability. So if you could clarify this more, thing, because you yeah. can perfectly buy the X argument to still be a chase, I think. Maybe because yeah. I have not understood the argument. Okay, no, certainly you can you could you could buy into my argument and still be a theist because you might think that there are good philosoph there's a good philosophical case for theism, uh, not rooted in S and T, um, absolutely. Um, however, most religions go beyond what can be established by means of some philosophical argument, you know, armchair argument or um, argument based on um, observation of the world. Usually, there are claims being made that are grounded in testimony and subjective experience, and you know, the Gospels. That's testimony. Um, um, my suggestion is that when we're dealing with X claims that are rooted purely in testimony and subjective experience, given that we know that we're so prone to false positive beliefs when those beliefs are rooted in that kind of testimony and subjective experience, that gives us an undercutting defeater for belief in the resurrection then. Um, so, so it's going to be bad news for Christianity, if not for theism. Insofar as Christianity is committed to belief in X claims where the basis of those claims, the grounds are subjective experience and or testimony, i.e. the Gospels, um, I'm suggesting there's an undercutting defeater. That's, that, that is my suggestion. So I'm not claiming that there's an undercutting defeater for theism because your theism may have other grounds. But the resurrection, no, it is based on testimony and subjective experience. Um, both. I mean, Craig thinks that there's a, a case to be made based on the Gospels and so on, that the testimony provides sufficient evidence. But his view is that even if it didn't, he could just know by virtue of the activity of the Holy Spirit operating on him, say that um, Jesus uh, is divine and was raised from the dead. He could just know that subjectively. So he's that's the it's a fantastic get out of jail free card. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Uh, I don't buy in the, that part of the argument, the subjective experience, all stuff. But I think that the experience is not, at least how it's presented, is not subjective. Like it's sort of uh, the testimony of the gospel is not, uh, say, like based on a mystical uh, 
<coughs> experience like, like uh, the mystical experience but you know yeah, right, we yeah. i hope that we will have discussion uh, we will have... yeah but testimony in the same way as you know testimony about um, alien abduction and ghosts and so on it's all testimony uh we know testimony regarding those kind of claims extraordinarily prone to false positive false positives that that's my that's my i mean i don't you know i yeah sorry i've made the point just shut up now <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That, no, thanks a lot. I, I would like, love to speak more about this, but unfortunately we are on a tight schedule. I might have to reread the article then. And uh, okay, we have a last question. I have uh, Samara. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you a lot for the presentation. It's very interesting. And my point is, you talk about this uh, uh, subjectivity and experience and testimony and you reject this the importance of uh, this to to believers right to to that's why i think you don't believe in disagreements and i don't know if you if you we we think if all demonstration it's a uh, or argumentation i don't know it's about beliefs it's a uh, we can see circularities. It's the point is um, I don't know the implication ethical. If you you if you defend this, you know because uh, I don't know if you get it. I cannot explain. <laughs> okay, okay. I am sorry. Have another go quickly. Quer falar em português? Eu faço a tradução. Um, ok, é porque eu entendo que nós confabulamos sobre a experiência e tal, mas é, se ele tira a força da, da subjetividade do texto, text, em português, do testemunho, né? Da, é o que fundamenta a crença, de alguma forma. O ponto é, para mim, isso é parte primordial do que, que fundamenta uma crença, entende? A subjetividade e o testemunho, óbvio, não sei. É, eu não sei se você entendeu para onde que eu quero ir. Se ele tira isso, aí ele tira também a agência, de algum modo, né? Que ele já ele coloca isso, e, e de alguma forma, por isso que cai num agnosticismo, né? Não sei, é, esse é meu ponto, se você puder explicar. Acho que é, é o que ele queria fazer. I'm sorry for his wish to Portuguese, just like... <laughs> Uh, <risos> se eu entendi teu ponto, era, é, 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 o argumento funciona justamente porque tira toda a parte do testemunho, da, sub da subjetividade. Então, mostra que, uma vez que se mostra que esse testemunho poderia ser baseado na. Cioè que a maioria da experiência religiosa é baseada no testemunho, e que esse testemunho não é confiável para todas as uh, motivações que ele apresentou, o argumento funciona. Então, é isso? Uh, não sei, eu queria saber o que ele pensa sobre as implicações do argumento, porque isso, para mim, tem implicações éticas e epistemológicas em algum ponto, eu acho que é isso, entende? Ah, se não geraria um tipo um ceticismo geral sobre o testemunho? Sim, 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 ah, sobre argumentação, então ninguém, ele retira a noção de, de desacordo, né? Então, de alguma forma, ele anula isso, não sei, é o que eu entendi. Muito obrigado. Oh, bacana. Uh, so basically, like to sum up uh, what Samara is asking is basically what uh, don't you think that uh, by challenging religious testimony and uh, epistemic, but yeah, this will not affect testimony as a whole as an epistemic standing? Oh, no, um, there's no reason to distrust testimony generally. It's just that we know that testimony regarding this particular subject matter tends to be highly unreliable as a source. Um, um, you know, I, 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 we know that, um, you know, just as we know that the testimony of, um, uh, I don't know, estate agents <laughs> is somewhat, somewhat uh, do you, you know, 
<clears throat> we'll be a little bit skeptical about estate agents when they're when they're when they're when when it, when it comes to what they have to say about the house we're planning to buy. Um, we'll be we'll we'll be much more cautious. Uh, but that 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 caution doesn't mean that we 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 ought to be equally cautious about all testimony. It's just that we we know we know that there's strong evidence that when it comes to this particular subject matter, people often tend to get it wrong. Um, they make mistakes. They misreport, um, they're subject to illusions or whatever, and we end up with testimony that's that's not reliable over and over and over again. And we're constantly coming up with examples where that has been shown to be the case. Um, that's not true of te testimony more generally. Deu para muito obrigado. Agora, em português com você e em inglês com você. Ok. Deu para entender? Yes, uh, I understand that's why he doubts about the agency. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I know we confabulated about the experience, but uh, my point is uh, it's a strong, but a strong argument, but uh, this ha I can see implication in epistemological questions, you know, because uh, you understand my point, I think that's it. <laughs> Yeah, Thank you. you're raising the worry that I might be proving too much. That the uh, that, that if this goes through, if this argument goes through, then um, various other beliefs that actually really ought not to be threatened will be threatened too. Um, and 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 that might be true, but we, you're going to need to sort of show that. At this point, we're just speculating. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So that's great. So thanks again, Professor Lou. OK. Pleasure. Yeah, I have to get going now. Sorry anyway. So um, thank you and uh, have a good day. Yeah, enjoy. Have a good evening. It's almost as evening there. Thanks. <laughs>